It is an absolute huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing the, the godfather of endodontics, Stephen Cohen. Everyone knows him from his book, Pathways to the Pulp. I think every dental student in the world had to read that book. That was that. That's just the textbook. So Stephen Cohen is one of the prominent endodontic clinicians in the United States. He lectures worldwide on endodontics. Dr. Cohen completed his studies in the endodontic postgraduate program at the University of Pennsylvania in 1969 before beginning his private practice. From 1970 until 1988, Dr. Cohen served as chairman of the Department of Endodontics at the Arthur Degoni School of Dentistry, University of Pacific, where he has, has continued his commitment to education as adjunct clinical professor of endodontics. In addition, he was an adjunct clinical professor of endodontics in the Department of Preventative and Restorative Dentistry, University of California, San Francisco, and director of the endodontic postgraduate program at the Rihad School of Dentistry and Pharmacy in Saudi Arabia. Dr. Cohen was the senior editor of all nine editions of the definitive endodontic textbook, Pathways of the Pulp, and is co-editor of the 10th edition, 2010, which was renamed Cohen's Pathway of the Pulp. He is also a co-editor of the new textbook, A Clinical Guide to Dental Traumatology, Dr. Cohen is a diplomat of the American Board of Endodontics and has held leadership positions in many of the major professional and academic organizations in endodontics. He maintains a full-time endodontic practice in San Francisco. I have to uh, tease you that uh, Mark Twain said the coldest day he ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. And Mark Twain was exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> it, is a, it is a bizarre town because I'm in Phoenix and you just told me the funniest joke I've heard and I've lived here uh, since 1987, you said it's so hot in Phoenix. Well, tell the joke. You said it. <laughs> well, uh, starting out on the very light note, what we had talked about before uh, we uh, uh, started uh, taping the show was you were telling me that uh, it was very hot in Phoenix, and I was telling you that I heard that it was so hot in Phoenix that they had a video of a dog chasing a cat, and they were both walking. <laughs> I'm going to tell everybody I know at uh, Phoenix by that. So, <laughs> so you um, graduated in '69. When did endodontics become one of the nine specialties recognized by the American Dental Association? I believe that was somewhere around uh, 1967. So, so you just you just came right after that. I've been uh, very fortunate in terms of timing that uh, shortly after endodontics uh, became a recognized specialty of the American Dental Association uh, that I, uh, by chance, happened to go into the endodontic field. So it was just a, it was a random chance? Well, it wasn't exactly a random chance. Uh, it, it's not common that things just happen strictly at random. <laughs> in, this, in, in this case, sometimes where, like a river, you know, there are certain meanderings and I started out in one direction. I uh, was originally going into micro paleontology, uh, but I decided to make a change and I went into the field of dentistry and I was so fascinated from my prior experience in paleontology that uh, things that were very small fascinated me. And it was through that that I became fascinated with the root canals as in our first year when we had to split teeth open and search for those canals and uh, everything followed from that. Uh, from my first year in dentistry, I sort of knew, I felt a gravitational pull to go into the field that would study those tiny canals. So as we've had, you know, you, you've been, how, how many years has it been since your first root canal? How many years have you been doing root canals? Uh, over 40 years now. And I, I want, um, we, we have a great example to talk to kids. M most of the people that listen to podcasts are seriously under 30. So you're mostly talking to dentists under 30. Um, but, you know, why don't, I, I wish you would talk about the history of it, though, because seriously, back then, I live in Phoenix, Arizona with a ton of retired people here, usually from the northern Midwest, the Dakotas, Minnesota. There were so many root canals that um, were silver point. And it looks like they weren't filed out. It looks like they, you know, it just, it looks like it violated everything you'd need to see on an x-ray. And they worked for years and years and years. Um, it kind of always reminded me that endodontics is more about what you take out of the tooth 
than what you put into the tooth. And then if you got it all cleaned out and put a silver point, it was surprising how many of those worked. Did you see a lot of those actually work back in the day? We, uh, in fact, my original instruction in graduate school, uh, we were supposed to use uh, silver cones in mesial canals uh, of uh, molars and, or, or buccal canals, if you wish. And the concept of even the fourth canal was not even on the radar screen at that time. So we have come a long way. Uh, we've learned a great deal. But you can see how uh, something like silver cones, uh, it was designed to fail uh, as we look in the rear view mirror because it was designed on the predicate that all root canals in cross section are round. When as we look at it more closely, we know root canals may be any number of things, but rarely are they round. So what do you think are the biggest advances in endodontics that you see today? And, and by advances, um, you know, actually make the root canal, you know, increase the success rate. Not just making it easier and faster to do, but actually increasing the success rate. Well, when you say increasing the success rate, uh, success, uh, depending on what metric is used, can vary widely. Uh, is it a histologic success? Uh, is it a clinical success? And over what time frame? Uh, but let me give you uh, uh, first a, a broad view uh, from a study that came out of University of Southern California, uh, wherein this study examined uh, uh, through the cooperation of various insurance carriers, they examined 1.465 million teeth. And they followed these teeth for a period of up to eight years. And what they found, again, we're using a broad brush here, what they found was approximately 97.5 of these teeth were successful eight years later. Now, were all these root canals filled well? Definitely not. But it shows the remarkable adaptability of the human body to accept the imperfect and still go forward. And so uh, if we take a closer look at the small percent that did fail that they could identify, the 85% of that small percent that failed, 85% failed primarily because there was uh, no crown placed on top of a posterior tooth, or there was a delay in restoring the access opening. That, that's an incredibly high success rate. So, so what do you, what, what is, um, what, what is going on in Indo now that you didn't see, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago that you think these, um, young kids should be focusing on, uh, to do better, faster, easier Indo that lasts longer? I can't promise faster. What we're looking for, the better should be, uh, what we aim for all the time. Will it ever be perfect? Probably not. But can we improve upon what we're doing? Definitely, yes. Uh, I would give uh, two examples that just uh, uh, in the moment, I would say uh, one advance is the development of uh, the cone beam technology, CBCT, enables us to see clearly the third dimension of these root canal systems. It helps us identify uh, extra canals, fourth canals, sometimes fifth canals, with the advent of uh, cone beam technology and the voxel size has come down to such a, uh, a small fraction of a millimeter that we can identify even those fourth and even fifth canals. Uh, another advance, uh, for example, in cleaning and shaping, I would call a disruptive technology, wherein uh, the uh, it's called the SAF system, and this SAF system has an instrument that does not uh, rotate, but rather moves up and down. And uh, there's no solid core as we have with all the other types of uh, uh, shaping instruments. Rather, it's just a uh, a matrix of a web. And this uh, this web 
is a collapsible uh, uh, instrument. So as it's placed into the root canal, it will expand and contract. It will expand or contract into the shape of the canal. So that's why it's called the SAF, self-adjusting file. Uh, it's quite remarkable, and to the best of my knowledge, there are over 60 investigations showing uh, its safety, efficacy, and success, which is quite remarkable. That is amazing. Um, I wish you, uh, do you know anybody who could make an online CE course on that for Dentaltown? We, uh, we put up 350 one-hour courses. They've been viewed 600,000 times. That sounds like a really important piece of information. That was the SAF system by Redent Nova? By Redent Nova. And the, the person whom I would recommend to present, uh, they have uh, a number of uh, very, uh, very good, uh, excellent speakers. And one of them uh, would be right here in San Francisco, Dr. Ove Peters. Another one uh, in Tel Aviv, is Dr. Zvi Metzger. Ove Peter, O-L-V-A. Uh, uh, no, it's O-V-E uh, Peters, P-E-T-E-R-S. And he's in and San Fran. He's in San Francisco. He's the chair of the graduate program at the Arthur A. Dagoni School of Dentistry, part of the University of the Pacific. And who was the other person in Israel? Uh, his name is Dr. Zvi, Z-V-I Metzger, M-E-T-Z-G-E-R. And you really, uh, you, you really think that's a, a, a new state-of-the-art breakthrough technology that uh, these kids should be looking into? I do. Well, could you, could you uh, email introduce me with Olvi and uh, Zvi Metzger and uh, see if we can get an online CE course? Well, send me an email later, and uh, certainly I'll uh, forward it uh, to uh, uh, to uh, Redent Nova, and I'll forward it to uh, Dr. Zvi Metzger, and uh, and I'll include Ov Peters. And and what what do you, what do you like about this self-adjusting file system? Well, uh, what, what's got you excited? Everything that we are talking about uh, at this time. Everything that I'm, I'm mentioning is based on good published literature, good scientific investigations. I try to avoid as much as possible uh, any uh, anecdotal comments. Uh, I like to do everything based on solid evidence. So as I uh, mentioned uh, uh, a while ago, uh, there are many uh, papers published on this SAF system. And, and I should hasten to add, I have no involvement uh, with Redent Nova. Uh, I simply, uh, I, in my professorial capacity, I simply report what the literature is showing. So, so you like the CBCT because I guess you're saying there that the largest failure rate of endodontics was there was no final restoration. So bacteria got in. Number but, two, you like the CBCT because a missed canal um, is leaving a lot of infection in there. And then the, well, third, and yes. the, and then the third thing you liked was this uh, self-adjusting file because you, the up and down motion you think is scrubbing out and cleaning and debriding the canals better? Well, it, it, you see what makes it unique is not only the fact that there's no solid core, but rather it adjusts to the cross-sectional shape of the root canal system, but in addition, while the instrument is moving up and down, at the same time, sodium hypochlorite is being flushed right through the canal simultaneously. So it's cleaning and shaping at the same time. See, the, uh, what we've had up to now is uh, we clean and then we shape, then we clean and then we shape. But imagine doing both at the same time. I... I would opine that that is probably why there's even a, a better success rate uh, with the uh, SAF system. You know, um, 
I, Dentaltown, um, you know, I, I watch all the questions and I, I look at it under the endodontic forms, but you hear a lot of kids saying this, that they like to irrigate with three different things. They like to mix irrigation with sodium hypochlorite bleach, Paradex chlorhexidine gluconate, and um, hydrogen peroxide, because those are three different um, um, irrigations. They kill different bugs, and then it's better to use three than one. What would you say to that kid? Well, using sodium hypochlorite still remains the standard of excellence. Uh, there are times, however, that it probably should not be used, where we have to compromise a bit because it is the issue of risk and benefit. And sometimes if there is a suspicion that there might be a perforation, uh, whether it's uh, a pathologic one uh, uh, through root resorption or if there's something iatrogenic, uh, the, there might be a perforation, or perchance there might even be a fracture in the root that is suspected but not proved. So when there's any doubt, instead of using sodium hypochlorite, uh, that's where Paradex would be quite valuable. Uh, uh, a more, uh, it's certainly a safer uh, disinfecting irrigant. Uh, and so under those conditions, or if there's an open apex, uh, under those conditions, uh, uh, Paradex uh, uh, would be a much better choice. Uh, and you mentioned hydrogen peroxide. I try to uh, discourage using hydrogen peroxide, even though in my original training, that's all we used along with sodium hypochlorite. We would keep uh, alternate from one to the other. Uh, and here's part of the reasoning. You see, when sodium hypochlorite comes in contact with hydrogen peroxide, for one or two seconds, there's an explosive bubbly release of oxygen. However, instead of using hydrogen peroxide on the shaping instrument that the dentist would use, uh, using something like RC Prep, uh, RC Prep contains, instead of sodium, uh, uh, instead of hydrogen, excuse me, Instead of hydrogen, it contains urea. Urea peroxide, instead of exploding when it releases its oxygen, it will slowly, uh, they're, they're tiny bubbles one can see, and over a period of 10 to 20 seconds, these, the oxygen will continue to be released. And considering that the microbes that we have inside the root canal system are primarily anaerobic, Having something that is constantly releasing oxygen is a far better choice, in my opinion. Well, when I say in my opinion, my, and my opinion is based upon good science that's published in the literature. And when you were talking about CBCTs, uh, what brand of CBCT do you think is best for endodontics? I wouldn't, uh, because it's changing all the time, I wouldn't stick my neck out and select uh, any one brand. But when it comes to that, here's what I uh, urge uh, young practitioners to do. First of all, when they're at a, uh, a dental uh, exhibit hall, uh, any person selling a particular product can claim anything. That it's the nature of the way uh, we, uh, we get our equipment. But uh, what the practitioner should ask for is, Show me the science. In other words, show me the literature that can back up what you say. And secondly, give me the names of several colleagues that I could contact who've been using this for at least six months. And let me hear from them directly. I'll contact them myself. And let me hear from them directly before I purchase this, that, or the other device. And some of these devices uh, can be fairly expensive. And I think most of the, most practitioners have the experience of having a bottom drawer filled with products that seem good on the exhibit hall. They used it once or twice, something broke or something didn't work. They became frustrated uh, and it ends up in the bottom drawer or in a closet. After having that experience a couple of times, that's how we gain wisdom. Uh, you, you're the one who mentioned uh, RC Prep. Do you still use RC Prep? I do. 
And to this day, ex I still explain, use RC explain what it is and why you still use it. I, I use it because uh, it contains EDTA, uh, a very good chelating agent, and it contains uh, urea peroxide. And that's uh, and, and based on the literature, I would say that's a very significant uh, combination. And it has a glycerol base, so uh, it's easy to apply to the instrument or for that matter to uh, use uh, any device to introduce it into the root canal. Uh, so one can introduce it into the root canal and then use the instrument or as I like to do, I just apply it uh, to the instrument directly. Okay, so go through those. Why, why did you like urea peroxide? Uh, because urea peroxide releases its oxygen content over a period of 10 to 20 seconds. Hydrogen peroxide releases its oxygen in one or two seconds. And uh, it's very easy to notice a difference. Uh, 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 for example, uh, if, if one will take a small cup uh, two small cups, put them side by side. In one cup, uh, have uh, sodium hypochlorite, uh, and in the other cup, have sodium hypochlorite. In the first cup, introduce hydrogen peroxide. One will see an explosive release of oxygen, uh, and in a couple of seconds, it's gone. Uh, and do the same thing with urea with uh, RC prep. And I'm mentioning a brand name, but there are uh, other brand names. Uh, generically, they're identical to RC Prep. So, so I'm uh, I'm using the RC Prep because that's how I'm familiar with mentioning it. Uh, so, if RC Prep is used with its urea peroxide, as the RC Prep contacts the hydro the uh, 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 the sodium hypochlorite one will see uh, just a bubbling. Uh, it looks like champagne. And that champagne-like quality will go on for about 10, perhaps 15 seconds, uh, somewhere along that line. So did you start out in Indo using Grossman cement? What was your first sealer and what sealer are you using now? Uh, the, my professor, uh, for whom I have, I hold close and dear in my heart, because he was a, a short man and a giant in his field. Uh, and my professor was Dr. Lou Grossman, for whom Grossman Sealer uh, was named. And uh, Grossman Sealer, as I think most know, is primarily zinc oxide with eugenol. And Grossman Sealer uh, has served uh, everyone around the world for many years but as we know, uh, over time, as we learn more, we have better devices uh, to see more. We have new instruments to conduct research. So we learn that over time, instead of Grossman sealer, uh, we look at bonding agents. So instead of uh, just sealing a root canal, the, uh, the main effort now is to bond gutta percha or perhaps its progeny uh, to the uh, to the cleaned and shaped uh, wall of Denton. And how's uh, how's Lou doing? When when did he pass away? Uh, oh, he passed away many years ago. Long time ago, Louis Grossman. Yes, oh, uh, a legend, just like uh, you. And, and I, <laughs> uh, well, he was my inspiration, and I don't know about I'll, I'll ever attain. Uh, the contribution to endodontics that my dear professor has made uh, because he was one of the original founders of the American Association of Endodontists. And he courageously, along with a handful of colleagues around the country, established our American Association of Endodontists right in the middle of World War II in 1943. And they decided to meet in Chicago uh, in February because the weather was so bad in Chicago. And to this day, it's still terrible in February. So they knew when they would meet, everyone would be at the meeting. No one would particularly want to wander the uh, shopping out in the streets. Is that why you picked Chicago? Uh, that's why they originally picked Chicago. 
but it was also uh, the equivalent of a halfway point. So colleagues on the west, in the Midwest and on the West, uh, Chicago was like, uh, in a certain way, the center of the country at that time. Well, you know, you can get anywhere in the United States within two hours if you're in Chicago or Dallas. There I mean, you are. Two hours. And uh, I've always wondered why the American, uh, not the American Dental Association, the Chicago Midwinter Dental Meeting, it's always in February in Chicago, and it's just brutally cold. And Chicago is just the greatest town in the world in April and May and September, October, November. And I'm always sitting here saying, why would you go to the greatest city in the world on the worst month of the year? And you think it's because they want us all in the dental meeting and not uh, shopping Miracle Mile? That's part of the speculation. Do we know that for sure? No, we don't. Uh, and, and, and another reason they like that is because the, the prices are so low in the winter. Because uh, all the room rates and meeting room rates skyrocket in prime time. But uh, only, only the dentists are. I, I want to go back to a lot of the questions. Uh, Dentaltown um, started in 1998. There's been over 4 million uh, questions and answers posted at that time. And one of the things the younger kids post a lot in the Indo forums is they know the pain is in this quadrant, but they're not sure which tooth it is. What, what advice would you give them when it's a hot tooth and they can't tell which one it is? Well, uh, that's an excellent question. And uh, to give a succinct answer, it would be taxing uh, because there are so many uh, elements that would add to the all the constellation of issues that come up uh, with diffuse pain. And uh, the right next to it is the issue of once we found the source, how do we actually prevent any further pain when we uh, perform the root canal treatment. When, so when it comes to diffuse pain, there's no short answer, but we need to conduct the entire battery of tests that we have from percussion, palpation, mobility, periodontal exam, testing with something cold, with something hot, in fact, using electric pulp testing, using transillumination, we have a, a battery of tests that should be conducted. And yes, they should be conducted. That entire battery of tests should be conducted on every tooth. Sometimes a patient is not even sure if it's an upper tooth or a lower tooth. It is all the more reason why we have to conduct those tests on every tooth. After we've conducted those tests, it's very likely that at that point, we will identify the hot tooth. And the, uh, one of the vexing issues for, for all dentists that are doing uh, molar endodontics is how do we effectively, how do we uh, effectively anesthetize a hot lower molar to assure the patient will have no pain as we make our access opening and extirpate the remnants of any pulp tissue that might still be in the canals. That, uh, that question is a perennial question. And I would submit this. In a way, it's far less complicated that, that, than many, many may uh, suspect. For example, if it's a hot lower molar, uh, uh, certainly we want uh, to have block anesthesia of the uh, mandibular nerve and, uh, and the long buckle. Uh, and then we want to allow a few minutes for that to take effect. The next step is infiltration on the, in the buccal tissue. And if it's done properly, we'll see a slight blanching because we, of course we want an anesthetic that has a vasoconstrictor. And what I use uh, virtually all the time, there are rare exceptions. I use a lidocaine, one to 100,000. If I'm doing surgery, of course, it'd be one to 50,000. But lidocaine, one to 100,000. We apply that for a black anesthesia, for the infiltration. And then when we see the blanching of the tissue, we've already administered the black anesthesia. The critical step that too many dentists miss is then they need to administer intraligamentary anesthesia. Very simple. And how do we know uh, if it's effective? 
Well, when it's performed properly, uh, again, we'll see, uh, it will feel resistance as we're trying to express the anesthetic, and we'll again see some blanching of the tissue, and that's done in the mesial and the distal. Before they used to uh, uh, teach, do that only in the distal. Well, that's very close, but not quite. And that's why I would recommend uh, two tenths of a cc in the mesial, two tenths of a cc in the distal, and one can begin treatment as soon as the syringe is put down. And I will say over 99% of the time, those patients will be profoundly anesthetized. Now, there are some exceptions, but I'll give uh, just two illustrations. One exception is uh, the drug addict. And under that category, uh, one drug, if I may, is alcohol. Uh, alcoholics, they, if they're really alcoholics, they're very hard to anesthetize. And those are cases where sometimes the endodontic treatment has to be performed under intravenous anesthesia. The other is actually the drug addict. Uh, it could be, uh, uh, well, it's uh, very often cocaine, but there's, uh, as we know, uh, there are all kinds of addictive drugs, and abuse of these drugs leads to a certain resistance, if not even being refractory, to being profoundly anesthetized simply through local anesthesia. That's where we have uh, a backup of intravenous anesthesia when needed. So did you have more fun practicing in Rihad, Saudi Arabia, since they had no alcohol? Did you get a lot more profound anesthetic because they don't uh, well, drink over there? <laughs> I, I, I will say this. Uh, what we see in the media is no reflection of my experience uh, when I was in Riyadh. My name tells a lot about my background. We don't need to go beyond that. And when I was in uh, Saudi Arabia, the, uh, my hosts were gracious. I found the students to be very bright, very inquisitive. And uh, the dental school there, I think, is one of the most remar remarkable dental schools I've seen anywhere in the world. And uh, the students there, they could be from Kansas. They're just like our students anywhere in the world. Young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, ready to roll. Now, I am from Kansas, so I, I love that story. I was born in Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> I, I want to I talk about another um, issue on the Dentaltown uh, boards with endos and the young kids. When, when you and I started, it would have been heresy to do a root canal in one appointment. It was always two appointments minimum. And then I think the pendulum might have swung over where there's a lot of doctors who do every single root canal, one appointment every time. Um, did, did you, do you agree that, you know, when you started, endo was two appointments? And did the pendulum swing too far? So, so when, when should you do a root canal in one appointment? And when should you sit there and say, no, let's let this heal up some before we arbitrate? Well, uh, let me give you a, uh, let me take a little time in answering that. Uh, when I went through my graduate training, endodontics was performed in three treatments. Uh, we would do our cleaning and shaping the first appointment. Then we had to get a negative culture. The assumption was if we got a negative culture, therefore the root canal was thoroughly disinfected. Of course, we all know better now, uh, but that's many years later. So the current uh, debate uh, literally is, should it be in two appointments, as you said, or one appointment? So to help address this with my endodontic colleagues, uh, and I would say this, as recently as last year, uh, the American Association of Endodontists uh, sponsored a, uh, a continuing education course where one of my uh, highly respected colleagues, Dr. Martin Trope, who believes in two-visit endodontics, and I strongly uh, believe in one-visit endodontic treatment. So we had a debate, and we agreed in this debate that we would 
debate strictly on the literature extant, and that we could not opine anything unless it was good evidence to support anything we claim. And I would uh, tell you that the debate is still ongoing, but to the best of my knowledge, the majority of endodontists are doing one visit treatment. Now, there are times when that cannot be done. There are a host of things that might come up uh, where it cannot be completed in one visit. Uh, sometimes it, uh, it could be an issue of uh, the, the patient, uh, it's an emergency, and the patient, once relieved of the, of the pain, uh, often it's an apical abscess. Uh, the patient is exhausted. They've been up all night. They've been taking all kinds of medication to try to contain the pain. And so as soon as uh, they get some immediate relief, they're too exhausted to stay in the chair to continue. So we place calcium hydroxide in the root canals under those conditions, and we have them return as soon as they can, perhaps even the next day. Uh, there is no benefit if one is going into more than one visit to delay more than a day. Uh, and so I would say based on the literature, the preponderance of the literature uh, supports one visit treatment. And uh, that's why we had an interesting debate. So is that why they separate you guys and keep you on the West Coast in San Fran and Martin and the East Coast in Philadelphia? You uh, is it a 3,000-mile wide debate? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's not just uh, North America. That debate goes on around the world. I, I want to ask you another question that's uh, concerning a lot of the kids now. As you know, the United States has had a lot of celebrities overdose on drugs. Um, Prince, one of the greatest musicians ever, uh, was on um, uh, opiates. And sometimes after root canals, the, I mean, there are so many older doctors who every single root canal just give 20 tabs of Vicodin and a script of Pen VK. And, and there are some people who will never prescribe uh, Vicodin because they think it's a scourge to society. Where do you weigh in on opiates? And what, do, what, do, what are these young kids, what are they supposed to do after they do a root canal and uh, they're worried about pain medication? That's a great question, Howard. Uh, I, would, I would say this, uh, in practice, I rarely have to ever use an opiate. Uh, if I prescribe one uh, every few months, I would say that's about my average. Uh, because there's, uh, there's good science to show the following. Of course, everything is based upon the patient's uh, weight. But for the average patient, perhaps let's say, for example, 150 pounds or 70 kilo if someone prefers. So for the average patient, using 600 milligrams of ibuprofen, along with two extra strength acetaminophen, Tylenol, that has, there's a synergy there, uh, wherein combining those two analgesics, uh, the, sum, uh, the, the sum is greater, uh, uh, the, the synergy is that there's a magnified effect wherein uh, the analgesic uh, equivalent is codeine, but without a narcotic. And I always follow patients, when I do root canal treatment, I'll make a point to always call that patient that evening, somewhere around uh, dinner time or shortly after, uh, just to make sure they're okay. Uh, I, I would say there are a couple of good reasons for doing that. Uh, the, the first is, uh, we really want to know, is a patient okay? And if they have any problem, we want to know that as well, so we can address it early on. Uh, the second is, for young practitioners just developing a practice, that makes their practice more robust, because patients are so pleasantly surprised when their doctor has enough interest that they would call them later on after the office is closed to find out how is that patient. I cannot tell you the, the benefit of developing an ethical practice in that manner. It, it goes leagues beyond what one could imagine. 
So if the ibuprofen, uh, uh, acetaminophen uh, protocol is used, that's, uh, uh, they should take it every six hours for at least 48 hours. What I tell patients, when they leave and when the anesthesia wears off, they should not have any pain if we were to say on a scale to 10, if 10 is severe pain, they should not have any pain that exceeds a three. If they have any, any discomfort that exceeds a three on the pain scale, they're urged to call my office. Now, when we're doing root canal treatment, we pre-medicate with the uh, regimen of acetaminophen and Tylenol and, uh, and ibuprofen. And we give it to them immediately before we anesthetize a patient. And that's when we start the clock every six hours. And the feedback from patients is remarkable. Now, there may be some out there in dental world that will have an element of disbelief. And I can only say, if one is really curious, go to the literature. Uh, Dr. Ken Hargraves, for example, has written about this subject. And I think most everyone knows Dr. Ken Hargraves. He's one of the giants in our Where is he uh, at? But, Where, where's he uh, at? He's at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And if you uh, haven't interviewed Dr. Hargraves or Dr. Lou Berman, uh, uh, Dr. Berman is a Maryland. Uh, uh, these are uh, extraordinary men who have much to offer uh, our dental colleagues. Well, I would uh, I would love for you to introduce us. I, I want to go back to after the uh, root canal. I mean, there's 211,000 Americans alive today who have a dental license, okay? And so there's a lot of them that after every root canal just give a pen VK. Now there's two groups of these people. One group, they just do it because they don't understand antibiotics and infections and whatever. But there's, but I'll be honest with you, Stephen. There's a lot of them who do it, who will say to me, Howard, I'm just CYA. I'm just covering my ass. There's a million attorneys out there and I think this will, you know, I, I don't ever want to get sued. And they say, you didn't even give antibiotics. Do you, do you think, do you think, so I know there's dentists who give antibiotics after every extraction and endodontics to avoid lit, uh, litigation. What, what, what do, you, do you think, t talk about dental litigation. What, what, what is, uh, how, how can dentists avoid more dental lit litigation? And what would you say to that dentist who's CYA giving a prescription of antibiotics after every root canal or extraction just because America has one million attorneys? <laughs> uh, the, uh, think of that as a two-edged sword. Because sometimes if one uh, routinely in a blanket fashion prescribes antibiotics, some patients are going to have strong side effects. Uh, and uh, unless one pays close attention, they could even have uh, an allergic response. So uh, I would be careful what you wish for in matters like this. Uh, that doesn't make anyone immune. There are attorneys out there, and sure, we... We all have our jokes about these attorneys. And attorneys, uh, there are some attorneys who will abuse the legal field uh, for obvious reasons of self-aggrandizement. Uh, but I would submit the attorney, and I've done uh, much expert witness work over the years, and I would submit that the large majority of attorneys are, are really trying to do the right thing and I have seen some tragic cases, uh, and I, there's not enough time to go into it, but where uh, basically patients have had their life diminished to the point where they're barely able to stay awake and stay alive for the rest of their life. So there's uh, no way for a patient like this to get any redress other than to sue the dentist. So uh, how do we minimize our risk of litigation? Well, first of all, one of the uh, main areas is that uh, too many dentists have incomplete records. Uh, either for any number of reasons, they do not take the time to actually read their own records or they don't take the time to really write out or enter into the computer exactly what they did 
why they did it, how they did it. This all sounds like it would take up time. And yes, it takes time. But think of the benefit of just slowing down and thinking through something that will avoid that will serve the patient and a lot and avoid a lot of grief potential grief and aggravation at a later time so filling out the records is one of the main things being readily available at any time uh, in other words patients should be able to reach their dentist very important uh, not only is it uh, uh, ethically appropriate, but uh, it's also good for robust practice development. Uh, there's an old adage, if you take good care of your patients, your patients will take good care of you. And it really works like that. One hand claps the other. So uh, the, uh, the other issues that come up, uh, I see in in dental litigation, a dentist did not use a rubber dam, an infection ensued, uh, and some of these infections have been very dramatic. Patients have been hospitalized. It all started with something as uh, not using a rubber dam, or even worse, leaving a tooth open to drain. Of course, when I went to a school, we were all taught to leave a tooth open to drain. Today we know, and based on the literature, that's the last thing we should ever consider because uh, it's like good news, bad news. The good news is uh, for a few hours, that patient will feel better. The bad news is we're introducing microbes into that root canal system that were not there before. And some patients are dilatory and they may not uh, come back immediately. That tooth could be left open to drain for weeks, sometimes for months. And then suddenly uh, they get a swelling uh, in their lower jaw, as an example. Uh, uh, mandibular molar, uh, I've seen this any number of times. And if that's not taken care of properly, that will travel down to the neck, down through the neck, go into the anterior mediastinum, and those patients come down with pneumonia. Yes, a root canal can lead to pneumonia if one does not follow the proper protocol for treating patients, and that includes do not leave teeth open to drain, period. I'm, I cannot think of any exception. What if it was your mother-in-law? Uh, <laughs> I happen to love my mother-in-law. <laughs> my mother-in-law is a World War II veteran uh, who served under Eisenhower, and Miss Annie DeLasso uh, is just an angel in herself. Oh, that's beautiful. I want, I want you to weigh in on probably perhaps one of the greatest controversies in dentistry, and that's amalgam versus composite. You always hear dentists say um, amalgams, uh, which are low cost, uh, they, they break the teeth, and endodontists love them because if you place an MOD amalgam, it's going to get a root canal someday. But the literature seems to show that, you know, the studies show that they, they last 12, 20, 30 years. And then composites... Um, are tooth colored. People want to believe they're great, but so many dentists say they last longer, but then a lot of other dentists say, no, the endodontists love the composites because when you're acid etching the dentin, et cetera, et cetera, um, that leads to endo. So I'm going to ask you, you're the most profound endodontist I know. You wrote, you wrote the textbook that probably every single person listening to this podcast read. Um, I, I, uh, I think I bought three different editions of your books and since 1984. Um, who do, what causes more root canals, amalgams or composites? Well, you're very generous in your comment. I wish I could take all that credit. But in all fairness, the, I, I, I was a senior editor of nine editions. And as an editor, of course, I had to read every word. And uh, there's a fair amount of work there to make sure everything ties together well. But it's the contributors who did the heavy lifting. So uh, that being said, Going back to amalgam or composite, uh, let me say this about amalgam. I have eight MODs on my mouth, and they were placed over 50 years ago. That's what I can say about amalgam. <laughs> amalgam. <laughs> nice. I love amalgam, it. Amalgam, amalgam, to this day, I would submit, uh, there's been, uh, it's been politicized to the extent that 
people have worried about the mercury that's an amalgam uh, without taking any recognition of the fact that uh, its combination uh, with uh, silver basically locks it in. But uh, we're not going to dwell on that. I just would say the uh, political aspect of amalgam is really the problem. Amalgam itself is a good, solid restoration, period. And as for composite, uh, composite, uh, and we've seen many generations of composites along the way. Uh, and each generation is truly better than the last generation. So uh, I think uh, composite, uh, it can be abused if it's, if one does not follow the directions for how to use it to bond it to the dent, or if it's, uh, if the cavity preparation uh, was made uh, uh, too uh, aggressively, there can be problems which are easy to attribute to composite. But I would submit that actually the technique of making uh, the cavity preparation often uh, is the real problem, but composite gets, by analogy, left holding the bag. I, I Do you agree or disagree with this statement? Placing a posterior MOD composite instead of an amalgam is an aesthetic health compromise? No, I don't, I don't agree with that. But I would also hasten to add here that the ones who could answer these questions best of all are prosthodontists. Because I'm looking at all of these issues, uh, thinking about how does this affect the dental pulp. Uh, amalgam, uh, if placed properly, has no effect on the dental pulp in a properly designed uh, uh, cavity preparation uh, and, and with proper case selection. Uh, and the same is true for composite. Uh, composite, uh, uh, the latest generations, uh, they're excellent. They bond well to, to dentin as long as the uh, young dentist follows the directions because sometimes in haste uh, some steps may be skipped and consequently those composites may uh, leak uh, or dislodge and it's easy to blame on the composite but I would submit uh, and I can't uh, certainly uh, say the literature shows this uh, not that I'm aware of but rather uh, uh, often it's the dentist who uh, hastily placed the uh, composite and did not follow all the steps to make sure it's secure in the cavity preparation. We're almost out of time. I'm trying to get through a lot of the questions that are always asked on Dental Town. You always have a kid showing the floor, you know, that they went in there to do the root canal, they took out the old filling, and they see a black line on the floor. And they're always posting a picture saying, you know, should I, is this worth saving? I mean, look at that. It's a black line. You can see it. I mean, they, they post the picture. What, what, what do you say to these kids when they're about to do a root canal, they take out all the old restoration, and there's a black line on the floor? Well, uh, there are different types of black lines. Uh, one uh, ostensible, ostensibly uh, uh, black line is the line that connects the mesial canals to the distal canal and a mandibular molar. And that black line is supposed to be there. Uh, it's not really black. It's only darker than the surrounding dentin. There are no really black lines inside uh, an access opening. But there's another type of uh, very dark line which does not uh, limit itself between the mesial and distal canals, but rather extends onto the mesial wall and the distal wall. Those black lines, that's an early indication that we are dealing with a vertical root fracture. And if we have a vertical root fracture, I can virtually assure that 100% of those teeth will be lost in the immediate or near future. So that means do not continue doing the root canal treatment if there's any recognition of vertical root fracture. One of the most vexing things for general dentists is when they place uh, a beautiful, expensive crown on a molar and the, the patient is pleased, the dentist is pleased, and a week or two later, the patient says, that crown doesn't feel quite right. 
I uh, find it's a little uncomfortable when I when I chew down on the tooth, and I find if I tap on the side of the tooth, that the tooth, uh, I often hear the phrase, feels funny. They don't quite have the vocabulary to describe what funny is. So what they're saying is that they have a heightened awareness of that tooth when they tap on the side. When patients report they're tapping on the side of the tooth and it, there's a heightened awareness, that's an early indication that very likely there's an incomplete or complete vertical root fracture. So listen well. The, again, there's another old adage. Listen to the patient because if we listen well, often the patient is telling us the diagnosis. And when we have a vertical root fracture, the only treatment should be removing the tooth and when possible, replacing it with an implant. I want to ask you uh, this broad question over the last years. Has the rise of implants uh, decreased the number of endodontic retreats and or apicoectomy retrofills? I, I can't say. Uh, I very much support uh, uh, I very much support implants. Uh, and I find like with almost anything in life, uh, the, one can uh, overdo it, and I sometimes see that. And, and I might add, going back to what we were discussing before, sometimes there's litigation because of the inappropriate application of implants. Implants are safe and effective when used properly. And uh, when there's a vertical root fracture, uh, that I tell every patient, uh, if it's possible, try to have this tooth replaced uh, with uh, an implant. And of course, the constellation of signs and symptoms of patient's anatomy uh, may be a guide as to whether or not it's appropriate to place uh, that implant. <clears throat> okay, I've only got a, like two more minutes, so i got to ask my questions faster. Um, I want to ask you a, uh, a philosophical question. Um, when I talk to dentists, they think filing down for a missing tooth, filing down the enamel off to adjacent tooth, they literally just think you're a hack. They're like, my gosh, I can't believe you filed down two virgin teeth to do a bridge. And I don't even know what virgin means. I mean, I went to dental school. They never discussed what a virgin tooth was. But then when I talk to my ear, nose, and throat friends and my rhinologist friends, they're like, why are you up there destroying this sinus and packing it with cow bone and paper clips and all this crap when you had two teeth that you could have filed down and done a bridge? So my question to you is, do you think dentists have a bias since they love teeth to leave the teeth alone and since they don't ever live in the sinus or just don't blink twice at going into a sinus? And do you think if all the dentists were ear, nose, and throats and rhinologists before we went to dental school that there would be a lot less sinus uh, grafts? Well, the second question is certainly much easier to answer. Uh, if, <laughs> uh, if every dentist was an otolaryngologist, uh, by all means, they would never end up in the sinus. I, I can't imagine that. Uh, but still, the training of dentists is, or certainly should be, uh, that they're taught, first of all, to recognize uh, where the sinus is in relationship to the apices of teeth. If any dentist ends up in the sinus, they either did not use cone beam technology when it was available, uh, or they simply made an error. Now, uh, in the human condition is such that all of us are imperfect. Uh, any of us can make an error. But telling the patient, I'm going back to what you brought up before about the litigation, telling the patient what happened and sitting with the patient in an unblinking way, simply telling the patient, I did my level best, and in spite of my best efforts, this case is failing. And allow the patient to express his or her uh, feelings about it, Ask, uh, allow the time for them to ask any questions and patiently answer every question. And that will reduce that risk of litigation about a case that fails. Going back to your question about the sinus, 
I, I would uh, finally say this, using cone beam technology, using the basic uh, knowledge that we certainly have uh, about the anatomy, there is no reason why a dentist should ever end up in the sinus. So on that note, uh, where's the best way to get Pathways to the Pulp by Stephen Cohen? Well, I... Or uh, Cohen, Cohen's, path, Cohen's Pathway of the Pulp. Cohen's Pathways of the Pulp, Expert Consult, Edition 10. Congratulations. Where, where, where's the best way to get this? Well, uh, actually, uh, Edition 11 uh, is, uh, is out there now. It's been out there for about a year. And that's through the Elsevier company. Uh, so just Elsevier.com and Pathways of the Pulp can be found there. Uh, used copies certainly can be found on Amazon. Uh, so there are any number of ways uh, to purchase uh, uh, Pathways of the Pulp. And let, let me just say the difference between a Kansas street smart boy like me and so many dentists I see is I'm... Um, you know, I will go buy a textbook for 150 bucks, and it and it take a month to read. And to me, um, so many of these young kids, they just go off to these uh, weekend institutes that cost three or four thousand dollars in airfare, hotels, tuition. Um, before I signed up for Carl Mish's course, I bought his textbook and read it twice. And when I got out there, I was blown away by how many questions people were asking, and I'm like. This is all in the book. Why would you fly all the way to Pittsburgh and then ask this elementary question? I just think street smart dentist would sit there and say, I mean, how much is your book? How much is it from El Elvisavir? Well, I, I can't say how much it is. It varies but it, from... But they're, they're usually... Yeah, what? 150? No, it, and, uh, I, I would say uh, it, it varies from country to country. Yeah, and, and, and the I, price of that book... The price of that book wouldn't even be 20% of the airfare to fly to these lectures. And then you got to stay at a hotel and go to restaurants. And I'll, I mean, the textbook is the mean and lean street smart dentist by textbooks. And, and you could probably, I mean, is there anything in that book? After you read your book, would you, anyone have any questions on endo? Well, uh, let me add, uh, if one uh, signs up for expert consult uh, within the uh, the world of pathways of the pulp, uh, one can get an answer uh, uh, by by doing that. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, one could uh, email the authors uh, of the various chapters uh, to see uh, uh, or to gather further information. And of course, uh, there's a there's a robust digital component to the book, uh, and that expert consult. A consult uh, it keeps everything updated, so it remains current up to the past month. Because the world is spinning so quickly now, it, everything constantly has to be uh, upgraded. Well, I'll tell you what. On Dental Town, we started in uh, '98, and we got 217,000 members on the website. 50,000 have downloaded Dental Town on the app, and this podcast will be on the app. But the um, the, the online CE, we put up 350 one-hour courses. They've been viewed 600,000 times. And I would do anything, including walking from Phoenix to San Fran, to get you to put a course on there because it would just add so much credibility and respect. I mean, uh, I know Louis Grossman was your idol, but I don't think I, you're the biggest brand name in dentistry. I mean, everybody read your book. I mean, when you think of endodontics, you just think Pathways to the Pulp by Stephen Cohen. And I cannot tell you what a huge honor it is for you to talk to me and my homies today about your amazing journey of endodontics. Thank you for all that you've done for endo. Thank you for coming on our show. And uh, I just have, I just had the most respect for you. I can't tell you how much I respect you. Thank you. You're very kind, Howard. It's been a pleasure spending this time with you. And to all of your followers out there, I wish them the best. And time permitting, if there's a question through email, and if my time allows, I'll be happy to answer any follow-up questions that may come from this journey. And what's that email? It's scohen at cohenendodontics.com. S-C-O-H-E-N, S-Cohen at cohenendodontics.com. 
Again, thank you so much, and I hope you don't freeze to death on this summer afternoon in San Francisco. <laughs> Bye-bye.